Good morning, and to any Romanian speakers in the audience, Buna Dimineza. Uh, I'll be talking about deep transfer learning for land cover classification on open satellite imagery. And in particular, I'll be sharing how we pre-trained modern deep learning models with the Fast AI library on the Big EarthNet data set, which consists of labeled Sentinel-2 imagery from 10 countries in Europe, and how we used models pre-trained on visible and infrared image channels as a starting point for land cover classification on open data from Slovenia. My name is Yoni Nachmani, and I did this work as an Earth on AWS fellow at Synergize. I'd like to thank AWS for providing cloud credits, and especially thank my mentor Anja, who's in the audience today, and the rest of the Earth Observation Research Team at Synergize for all of their guidance in the process. I'll start with a definition. Just quoting from the FastAI website, transfer learning is a technique where you use a model trained on a very large data set, usually ImageNet for computer vision, and then adapt it to your own data set. The idea is that it has learned to recognize many features on all of this data and that you'll benefit from this knowledge, especially if your data set is small compared to starting from a randomly initialized model. And research has proven that on a wide range of tasks, transfer learning nearly always gives better results. And it's very useful for satellite imagery tasks, especially where you don't have a massive amount of labeled data. But transfer learning on ImageNet is limited when it comes to satellite imagery. To begin with, Satellite imagery looks very different than the everyday images of dogs and cats that you'd find in ImageNet. Here you see very specific patterns of farms, fields, and forests that are unique to satellite imagery. And in addition, even in one image, you can find multiple different classes of land cover on Sentinel-2, which has a 10-meter spatial resolution. And even with very high resolution data, you'll find many small objects. So if you could pre-train models on a satellite image data set for satellite image tasks, you get some advantages. And that's what the promise of Big EarthNet provides. Uh, a potentially more challenging problem is that uh, mainstream AI models pre-trained on ImageNet only see signal from the RGB bands which are present in everyday images. But satellite imagery contains a wealth of information, including bands in the non-visible parts of the spectrum. And those are intentionally collected because they provide useful information for detecting uh, and distinguishing classes on vegetation and others. But it's not built in to uh, your, your uh, out-of-the-box deep learning models. Uh, in particular, if we talk about open data sets like Sentinel-2 and Landsat, they're collecting many more than three RGB image channels and we want to leverage that information in our models, especially for tasks around, let's say, vegetation, crop monitoring, land cover. So there's an open issue right now in the machine learning for satellite imagery community about how to best fine-tune pre-trained models on images with more than three bands of input. Um, this is actually a, an issue from Lewis Fishgold at Azavia saying that you know, even if satellite imagery looks different than ImageNet, Pre-training on ImageNet gives you benefits, but it's not straightforward how to use an ImageNet pre-trained models on images with more than three bands. And it's still a very experimental area and one that could provide a lot of benefit for a lot of people in the audience today. More generally, when we're designing specialized models uh, for deep learning on satellite imagery, we want to leverage all of the unique properties of satellite imagery, which is you know, rich and structured compared to everyday images. Uh, specifically, we want to build models that are equivariant to the specific location on Earth that the image is from, the camera position and orientation, the time of day that the image was acquired, the resolution of the pixel, the amount of illumination in the image, etc., etc. Uh, other considerations when it comes to satellite imagery is that for data sets like Sentinel-2, you're collecting images over the same spot uh, many times in a year. So you have a time series type of data, and you want to understand how to best leverage that uh, temporal information um, while also mitigating the issue of cloud occlusion, which blocks uh, you know, areas that we care about in some of those scenes of data. So this is the, the holy grail. If we can build models that 
handle all the unique properties of satellite imagery. Luckily, uh, there is a litany of open source libraries that have made machine learning on satellite imagery even more accessible and powerful than ever. And we've started to hear about some of those libraries and we'll continue to hear about them today. So EO Learn from Synergize allows you to build workflows that handle multi-temporal and multi-resolution data. Uh, RoboSat Pink is integrated very well with OpenStreetMap and other uh, you know, tools in the open source ecosystem and allows you to easily visualize uh, labels and predictions. And Solaris from SpaceNet um, has, you know, for just in a couple lines, you can do inference um, using pre-trained models on SpaceNet data um, to predict roads and buildings on models trained from many big cities around the world. So we're very lucky to be in the time where open source libraries make machine learning for satellite imagery easier, but still there's room to grow in terms of fully leveraging the properties of satellite imagery, in particular, the multispectral nature of the data. So many practitioners now are interested in the fast AI library, which is built on top of PyTorch and builds in best practices of machine learning and allows you to train models pretty quickly by utilizing uh, pre-training on ImageNet. Uh, here's one example that the uh, co-founder of FastAI, Jeremy Howard, posted about, you know, about Development Seed based in DC. They actually built a tool that allows you to scalably uh, infer um, any FastAI model on your data set. There's a movement in that direction, and in particular, um, just another, going back to Raster Vision from Azavia, they're planning on uh, building a fast AI integration with Raster Vision and ultimately replacing the TensorFlow backend with the fast AI backend. And a big motivation is around making it easier to handle more than three channels of data. Um, you know, their initial idea is that you can change maybe the first uh, layer, the first weights to add in more channels, but there's a lot of other considerations. And luckily, you know, if you're trying to answer the question, how do we start thinking about pre-training, training models on more than three bands of data, FastAI comes to the rescue again because they actually have a modern version, an extended version of a ResNet called XResNet, which has, in addition to improvements on the regular ResNet, um, better, fast, more efficient training and other things that you can look up, the FastAI version of the XResNet allows you to input any number of channels. One channel, three channels, five channels, and that's built in. Um, but you'll note that uh, this model is, you know, starts from scratch. It doesn't have pre-trained weights at the moment, but it solves the problem of handling multiple bands. And down the road, FastAI is planning on contributing back to PyTorch models that are pre-trained on ImageNet. But for now, we have a roadmap on how to take in four or six channel data and use the X ResNet, pre-train it on Big EarthNet, and then apply it for a downstream task. Other benefits of using FastAI, as I mentioned, they integrate uh, best practices of machine learning, and they have a course where they explain how these um, like tools work. For example, they have uh, mix-up data augmentation, which is um, cutting edge, and you can easily call that with one line. They have mixed precision training, which allows you to train models even faster than FastAI provides out of the box. And as I mentioned, the XResNet. So you can put all of these techniques together um, to, without being a machine learning expert per se, and apply it to your tasks. So back to this concept of pre-training models on Big EarthNet. Um, yeah, the, the idea here is that we finally have a data set almost at the level of ImageNet in terms of having a lot of examples, so five, around 590,000 examples, images, that are labeled with land cover here, over 40 classes of land cover. Um, and if you can pre-train models on Big EarthNet, on RGB, and near-infrared and short-wave infrared data, then you're set for the task that you care about. Uh, but we'll note that this data set only comes from Europe, so if you're trying to build a model that generalizes to other parts of the world, now, this is the best that we have right now, but we'd want to build more representative data sets. So what results did we get and what do they mean? Um, so on the input bands, RGB, RGB near infrared, RGB near infrared, and shortwave infrared, yeah, the accuracies look pretty close together. The F score, which F1 score, which balances recall and precision, 
there's a little bit more of a difference, but here it doesn't look per se that there is a significant difference when you add in these other bands. But if you go a little bit deeper, you can see that the examples with the top losses, um, looking at the one on the left and the right, um, the labels that are, the actual labels are a bit hard to visibly see from the images, or they're potentially mislabeled. The example on the right, is it really an estuary or a sport and leisure faci like facility? These are limits when you're working with your data sets that the labels might be noisy. So we think that getting around 95% accuracy is the best you can do on this data set. And what's more important is that now we have models pre-trained on near-infrared and shortwave infrared bands that then we can apply for the task that we really care about. And for us, that's land cover mapping. But wh why is land cover mapping an important problem? Building better land cover maps helps support informed land policy. And land and land policy is a critical tool in fighting climate change, uh, according to the latest uh, intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change report. Uh, you know, land, our 52 million square miles of collective land is under unprecedented pressure from human activity and climate change. It's causing food shortages now into the future and is uh, displacing many people, uh, particularly affecting people in poorer areas of the world. So it's a major problem that we're dealing with now, how to best manage land and support policymakers. And the satellite image community has you know, stepped up in this regard. But the most visceral example for me has been the recent uh, record-breaking fires in the Amazon to um, make room for growing cattle, right? There's priorities in the limited land that we have, and some things are solved by politics, but if the remote sensor community can make better maps and help get a better sense of what's on the ground, um, that's part of the solution here. And as I mentioned, the satellite imagery has focused on this issue in the last year. For example, Radiant Earth Foundation convened a workshop uh, last summer bringing together experts in land cover to develop best practices for deep learning for land cover classification, and Radiant Earth is also working on building a labeled training data set of global land cover from Sentinel-2 open imagery, and you should keep an eye out. They're planning on labeling and releasing that data starting in the fall. In addition, last summer at the Premier Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference, a consortium of players like Facebook, Digital Globe, Cosmic Works, universities, and um, they, they came together to push the computer vision community to focus on remote sensing problems, which they haven't prioritized as much, and provided three tracks on buildings, roads, and land cover. Uh, but you'll note that this land cover data set, which is openly available, only provides imagery in RGB to make it easier for computer vision people, and it's at a single moment in time. And again, we care about this temporal evolution of land, and that helps us actually distinguish classes of land. Here comes the uh, Lovenia land cover and land use data set from Synergize. It's open. There are blog posts, three of them, about the data set and models on top of them. And it provides Sentinel-2 imagery, like the free data that you could get on your own at 10 meter resolution, over the entire year of 2017. And land cover labels provided from the government of Slovenia mapped onto a uh, commonly adopted taxonomy of land cover classes. So that's the downstream task that we care about, land cover mapping on this data set. A little bit more about the preparation. Um, the Slovenia was split into equal area parts, and then uh, data from the red, green, blue, near infrared, and two shortwave infrared bands were added, but a cloud mask was layered on top of that to filter out potentially noisy examples and other vegetation indices like NDVI were also calculated and provided. And uh, the labels, again, come from 10 classes that we care about, cultivated land, forest, grassland, shrubland, water, wetlands, tundra, artificial surfaces, bare land, snow, and ice. This is a pretty challenging problem. 10 classes, you're going to have a lot more of some like forest than others like wetland. Um, and you're talking about, again, about temporal data. So there's a lot of interesting problems here. And the way to handle temporal data, the way that Synergize did, was because data is not acquired at a constant rate, 
you actually need to interpolate from all the data you have in a year, you know, um, regularly spaced out intervals of data, which is a pretty computationally expensive task, and assumes that you actually have enough data over a year that's not cloudy. And actually, some of those real scenes won't be used because they don't fit in these regular intervals. That's a downside of methods where you basically feed in the entire year's worth of data into the models. But it's still possible. And, and basically, um, Synergize tested out a traditional pixel-based model and a deep learning model that takes into account spatial and temporal context. And here are some of the results that they already got before this project, which um, just a little bit more about the model. Um, it's a unit that also has a temporal dimension. And as I mentioned, benefits about using uh, models with spatial context and temporal context. And the results from this experiment, group color image, reference map, pixel-based model, deep learning model. And you can see a little bit, there's a slightly smoother predictions with the deep learning model, because it takes into account spatial context. And the scores that we care about, uh, you know, accuracy in F1, let's say at no buffer level, you're getting slightly better results with the deep learning model, as well as on a per class basis. And I definitely recommend, if you're interested in this, um, look at this poster and look at the three blog posts that Synergize has put out and uh, talk to Anjay or others. Okay, so back to our task. We have models pre-trained um, on RGB, near infrared, and short wave infrared data um, from FastAI. And here is where FastAI and its emphasis on pre-training makes our lives easier. They actually have the ability to basically create a UNET model from any encoder that you have, any pre-trained model, any image size, any you know, ResNet 18, uh, 34, 50, it can handle that for you in essentially one line. But there's a little bit of work to give it not an ImageNet pre-trained encoder, but a Big EarthNet pre-trained encoder. And a uh, significant limitation is that these models, you know, they work from everyday images, which only expect one moment in time. That was the starting point, is let's take one scene that we have. We have the annual labels, and can we learn that mapping? Acknowledging that it's a bit noisy there because one moment in time doesn't reflect the entire year. Um, but let's, let's see how this performs, and we can think about um, ways to better handle the temporal aspect later. So potentially combining, giving as an input stage one scene, getting many different predictions, and then somehow aggregating those predictions. So instead of feeding the entire year as the input, feed each scene at a time as it's collected, whatever we have available, and then get predictions and then figure out afterwards how to get annually. So a uh, quick um, note on the results. Here, the, the difference in accuracy and F1 score is a little bit more noticeable. Still not quite as dramatic, but between the RGB and RGB with the one near infrared and two shortwave infrared, we get a noticeable difference in accuracy and one that could you know, help what we're doing if the goal is to get um, the highest accuracy possible with deep learning models. Um, but, and, and, and zooming in a little bit to the per classes, you know, forest, grassland, artificial surfaces, cultivated land, a couple examples that we care about, for which distinguishing them is difficult. You're getting improvements from the RGB to all the near infrared bands. In general, um, grassland goes down, but the overall, all these classes, the weighted average goes up. But it's not doing as well as the previous model. And again, the big limitation is you're losing this temporal signal, which really helps you distinguish classes. So what are future directions? Um, here from RoboSat Pink, there are other loss functions you could use. So we want to explore the Lavage loss for multi-class problem and see can that help the single scene model by getting better uh, spatial shapes that exist in data. Um, also, there's a lot of text, but the idea is if we're going to use the ImageNet pre-trained weights from three channels instead of training from scratch, how would you get the fourth band? What are some considerations to do? And this is an open area of research that some people are exploring and is definitely worth doing. And the last thing we care about is how do we do this aggregation at a year level? This is a paper that suggests three methods. One, you just take for a pixel the plurality vote. And other methods where you take in the class predicted and the probability and combine that in some smarter way to get the annual label or the annual, like match your ground truth and predictions at an annual le level. And it worked for this team, but there are a lot of open directions here. And the overall goals of this project were to bridge some of these problems and communities. So bridging the single scene and the multi-temporal models, 
uh, bridging different libraries and bridging some of the advancements made on high resolution data for roads and buildings with uh, lower resolution open data from Sentinel on many classes of land cover um, and thinking about the temporal aspect as well. Thanks. Thank you for perfect timing. And uh, I'm sure there's many questions, so you can start. Yes? First? So, great presentation. Um, two questions. One, if you can talk a bit on how this uh, labeled data set was created, who labeled the examples. Um, and the second one, if you train a model with Sentinel-2, for example, will you be able to apply the trained model on other data sets, higher resolution, for example? Mm, great. Um, so on the first question, how are the labels acquired? For Big EarthNet, it came from the Korean land cover uh, data set in Europe, which is made by experts. For Slovenia, that data came from the government. So it's official data, which you don't always have. Um, but it's also generally high quality. On the second question, will a Sentinel-2 model work for higher resolution data? Um, it's an interesting question that you should explore on your own as well, but it seems even in Sentinel-2, in Sentinel you lose some specificity, like roads are lost and other things. Different classes can exist in one pixel, so it's, it's hard to say that a low resolution model will work on a high resolution, but still the knowledge you get of features, let's say from Big EarthNet, I think taking that first part and then applying it on high resolution data could be an interesting thing uh, to look into. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, two questions. The first one actually linked to this one is uh, the different bands of Sentinel actually have different resolutions. Have you looked at, at that issue? Because that might actually cause some problems in, 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 in the results. And second of all, have you been able to look at which features were activated in the encoders depending on when you look RGB and when you look at the more complete set of bands? Great question. Uh, so the first question, how do you deal with Sentinel-2? Different bands have different resolutions. For now, we're using traditional uh, resampling methods um, to get, say, the best resolution is 10 meters. You also have 20 and 60. We just use out-of-the-box resampling there. But there are, is the potential to use models that learn um, in a more data-driven way how to do that resampling. Um, on the second question about which features are activated, I think that's another interesting direction that we did not have time for. Uh, it's built in in some ways to the FastAI library, which is another benefit, but it would be worth uh, probably extending for this multi-class problem the ability to visualize features or just use into FastAI or use other out-of-the-box tools. But I think actually visualizing um, yeah, where in the image uh, things are being activated is not in general very built in, but you can, let's say, visualize, yeah, right, you can visualize filters, which we did a little bit to sanity check, but I think it's not, uh, in general, the software around that isn't extensible for different models, um, which is a challenge. So you obviously work on the EOLearn patches. Have you tried anything else, like for a measure, like to classify the land cover based on some different areas, except for the EO patches? Um, can you uh, say the question one more time? Well, the EO patches are like from the EOLearn, they're like tiles, small ones. So have you tried maybe consider a larger area or something like that for classification of the land use? Yeah, yeah. So. In general, the EO patches are pretty extensible, so you can say maybe what size a pixel you want or where the data is from, and this data set provides free EO patches over Slovenia, but the Synergize team has looked at other areas, including using models pre-trained on Slovenia for other countries. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I also have a question regarding uh, the labeling. Um, you said first you were, so I need to, uh, maybe you can tell us how the labeling really works a bit more in detail. Is this pixel based or is contact based? Context based, sorry. Because probably the difference between Obaya and, and this kind of method. Um, so just to be a bit more hmm. technically clear how, how you used it. Thank you. And, and are you wondering about the Big EarthNet data set, the Slovenia data set, or both? Um, 
Um, so Slovenia would uh, actually, because that's more defined, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in general, that data set is labeled, as I mentioned, the labels come from the government and that's aggregated across a lot of um, specific, say, fields, areas. I think uh, Anjay would know the specific process, so if you want to answer that from the audience, you pass it. So the labels are um, provided by the Ministry of Agriculture and these are uh, manually labeled um, orthophoto um, polygons of forest um, yeah, vectors. In, it's in a vector format, yeah. Thanks so much for your questions. If you have more questions, we can talk after the session. Thank you.